He is risen. He is risen Good. You're going to need that a little bit later. Dan just read to us from the Gospel of John. It was about that first day, that very first evening. It was that very first Easter, and it was in the evening. The hour was late. The night was dark. The disciples of Jesus were huddled together behind doors that were locked. Their leader was gone. Their hopes were dashed. Their lives were in danger. Their Lord had been crucified, and they were afraid that they too would be found out and possibly put to death. The Bible says they were in fear. Now, I've given each one of you a little outline for this sermon, something to keep you busy, but also something to take home from this wonderful morning. The Bible says that they were in fear. Have you ever been there? I mean, in fear. Or maybe apprehensive. Or, you know, maybe those butterflies in the stomach. Then the most incredible, the most unprecedented thing happened. Jesus appeared in their midst. Resurrected and alive, powerful and in command. His message to them was, peace be with you. Just, just like the angel's message to those shepherds on the night of Jesus' birth. You know, in the presence of divine glory, fear is the natural reaction to stand before the glorious, righteous one. And Jesus says, peace, do not fear. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will be with you even to the end of the age. The message of Easter Sunday, then as today, is be not afraid. Jesus Christ is risen indeed. On this beautiful Easter morning, I want you to know that the resurrection of Jesus gives us at least three vital things that assure us that we are not alone and that we do not have to live in fear. First one, be not afraid. Your life has meaning and purpose. Maybe what most distinguishes human beings from other creatures is our ability to ask why. And in particular, our apparent need to ask the question, why am I here? This is a question that often becomes overpowering in midlife after we've done all that the world has told us we need to do to be happy and fulfilled. That's when we start asking, well, what's this all about, really? What does it mean? Has my life mattered? Not everyone asks these questions consciously. Maybe they ask them through their behavior the midlife crisis, the change of careers, various forms of risk-taking, delusion leading to depression. Likely you can think of others. Even when you're young, our lives, most of, experience, uh, most of us experience a yearning for our lives to do something great, to count for something, to make a mark. The truth is, people never seem so lost as when they have no purpose to live for, and they never seem so alive as when they do. Where does this need for significance come from? Is it an evolutionary accident? I love Sir John Templeton's comment about that. He said, would it not be strange if a universe without purpose accidentally created human beings or who are so obsessed with purpose? Is it a cruel cosmic <coughs> hoax played on us by an empty universe that is devoid of meaning and purpose and unable to provide meaning? Or is that desire for meaning and purpose put in our hearts by our Creator, <coughs> as the Bible tells us? As it is written, he has made everything beautiful in its time. 
He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. The resurrection of Jesus makes sense of us. He tells us that the heavens are not empty, that we are not alone in the cosmos. The resurrection of Jesus tells us that at the heart of the universe, there is a heart that cares. At the center of reality, there is a personal God who intentionally brought you into being. The resurrection of Jesus tells us that God created you for a purpose, a purpose that success and wealth and possessions can never fulfill. Because as large as the world is, it is too small to fill the longings of the human heart because, because God has written eternity into the very fabric of your being. That's why Easter Sunday tells us that the universe is full of meaning. Every star declaring the glory of God. Every sunrise a generous gift. Every human being important. And every choice we make significant. The resurrection of Jesus tells you that your life is meant to say something important. Your life was intended to bring some gift into the lives of others that is unique and beautiful and good. Who you are and how you live matters because you matter to God. Be not afraid. Easter Sunday tells us. Discover what matters to God. Live for what is most true and most real. And your life will be filled with meaning and purpose more than you ever imagined. The second thing the resurrection of Jesus tells us is be not afraid. Our problems can be overcome. Friends, being a pastor is sometimes a marvelous gift. It allows you to experience the lives of people when they experience their greatest joys and when they also go through them some of the most difficult times in their lives. And I cannot step up here on a Sunday morning without remembering that many who are present are facing terrible problems, carrying tremendous burdens, and suffering great pain. I know that many of you come to church on Sunday and you put on that smile on the outside and say, fine, fine, but on the inside, you're broken, broken and hurting. And sometimes I come to church on Sunday like that too. Some of you here this morning, if you told us your story, tears would fill our eyes and our hearts would break with yours. Life is hard on people. People are hard on people. It's unfair and callous and even brutal. It was for Jesus. He understands what you're going through. The resurrection of Jesus tells you this. Be not afraid. Your problems can be overcome. You are not alone and Jesus will see you through. Have you ever been betrayed by someone you loved? Or maybe someone you didn't really love? You are not alone. Jesus has been there. Have your motives been misunderstood and maligned? Have your best efforts been misconstrued and attacked? You are not alone. Jesus has been there. Have you given your life to others only to see them walk away or walk all over you? Have you felt the warm tears of grief fall on your cheeks because you stand by the grave of a loved one? 
you are not alone. You need read only the story of Jesus and Lazarus. You'll find that Jesus has been there too. Shortly before his death, Jesus told his disciples, In me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Life is full of pain and suffering. It was for Jesus, and he told his disciples that it would be for them. But then he said, be encouraged, I have overcome the world. Now how does that make any sense? It doesn't without the resurrection. If Jesus was a teacher and nothing more, if Jesus was an encourager and a motivator who believed in people but nothing more, if Jesus was a beautiful life that shined for a magnificent moment but was extinguished forever on the cross, his words would make no sense at all. But if, on the third day, he was raised from the dead, if he lives even today, and if we can receive him into our lives through faith, then he makes perfect sense because it means that when he comes into our lives, the same power that kept him from hatred and bitterness and self-pity and despair can live in us. And we can overcome whatever problems life throws at us. On August 15th, 1934, famed explorer William Beebe climbed into a bathysphere, that's a miniature submarine, and he descended to a depth in the oceans that no human being had ever reached. His bathysphere was made of extremely thick layers of steel, able to withstand the crushing pressure of the ocean depths. And in the darkest depths of the ocean, he discovered amazing creatures, black shrimp, transparent eels, bizarre fish never seen before. And for years, people disputed him, thinking he'd made it all up because it was so strange and unusual. Amazingly, these strange creatures exist at great depths, but they do not have thick outer skins. In fact, their bodies are quite flexible and they move about easily. Their secret is that they compensate for the outside pressure with an equal and opposite pressure inside themselves. There is, in a sense, a power within them that is as strong as the pressure outside them. <clears throat> How we handle the problems of life is very often the way a bathysphere compensates for the pressures of the deep. We become hard on the outside. We create thick walls so nothing can get to us. And we do all we can to protect ourselves from the problems and the pressures that surround us. But there is another way. That is to be filled with a power on the inside that can withstand the challenges that come to us from the outside. Last week I said it, the word of God inside us allows us to handle whatever is outside of us. Jesus Christ is the living word of God. And the promise of Easter is this, the resurrected Christ will enter your life with the power that caused him to overcome the world. It's unfairness, it's cruelty, and he will enable you to overcome it as well. You need only receive him as your savior and director, and then you too will be able to say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Some of you are facing this first Easter without a loved one, and your heart 
hurts. Some of you are so worried about your children, they seem misguided, even bent on destroying themselves, and you seem unable to help them, and you're scared to death. Some of you have a marriage that is struggling, or, or a spouse who's been unfaithful. Some of you, from your early years, have been told that you are unlovable and that you are unworthy of anyone's time and care. And you carry that with you wherever you go. Please hear this. The resurrected Jesus knows, and he is with you. He is the power that will hold you. He is the power that will heal you. He is the power that will help you rise up and overcome all that comes against you. You will find that power is alive in Jesus when you find Jesus alive in you. Now the third thing that Easter tells us is this. Be not afraid, our sins can be forgiven. Death is inevitable. We all know that, but we don't like to look at it too closely. I think it was Woody Allen who, says, who said, I'm not afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> One thing I want to be late for, that's my own funeral. It's not so much death that we're afraid of, but not knowing what's on the other side. In my 27 plus years as a pastor, I have conducted hundreds of funeral services, even for family members and close friends. And each time, I am reminded that the one so recently walking among us, sharing times with loved ones, that, that one leaves us and passes into death alone. And then they will stand before God. I suppose because I'm getting older, I think about my own death now and then. If life is good to me, I will be able to pass away peacefully, surrounded by family and loved ones. And then I will stand alone before God. And he will see my sins and he will judge my life. Friends, that hour will come for you one day. You will stand before God and he will see your sins and your life will be judged. There's a beautiful verse in the Bible. You'll find it in Hebrews chapter 7. There, referring to Jesus, it is written, Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. You know, that's, that verse reminds me of baseball. It reminds you too of baseball, doesn't it? You all caught that, didn't you, immediately? Yeah. Or at least a memorable moment in baseball. 66 years ago, April 1947, Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier and became the first black man to play Major League Baseball. He was chosen by Brooklyn Dodgers manager Branch Rickey to help integrate baseball. He was chosen not only because he was a fine player, but because he had already shown himself to be a man of great character and inner strength. Traveling with the Brooklyn Dodgers, Robinson was assaulted with insults and jeers in every ballpark they played in. One day in Cincinnati, he committed an error, and the crowd began to boo him and ridicule him with every low-life racist expression you can imagine. 
they cried out, He doesn't belong here. Get rid of him. Send him back to where he came from. Humiliated, Robinson stood at second base all alone. And then he felt a presence beside him. It was a teammate, shortstop Pee Wee Reese, team captain, all-star, and a future Hall of Famer. He placed an arm around Jackie's shoulder, and he stared up into the stands, waiting until the shouting stopped and the crowd became silent. Jackie Robinson would later say that arm around his shoulder saved his baseball career. One day, I will stand before God alone, and so will you. Our sins will cry out. He doesn't belong here. Throw him out. Send him away. And honestly, our sins will be right. Not one of us can stand before the holy God, righteous in ourselves, deserving of heaven. All have sinned, the Bible says. All have fallen short of the glory of God, and all deserve judgment. Your only hope, and my only hope, is that when we stand there before God alone, Jesus will come beside us, put an arm around our shoulder, lift up a nail-scarred hand and say, He belongs to us, Father. I died for Him. He has trusted in me to save Him from His sins. He is ours. The cross is God's way of telling you, yes, he cares for you. He'd, he'd sacrifice his life for you. And Easter is his promise that he will care for you, not only in this world, but he will love you right in the into the world to come. You don't have to be afraid of that moment. The Bible says Jesus is able now and always to save those who come to God through him because he lives forever to plead with God for them. So I guess there's really a fourth vital truth that Easter tells us. It's this. Be not afraid. You will not be alone. Your life has significance and meaning. Your problems can be overcome. Your sins can be forgiven. Receive the risen one. Open, open your locked doors and let him in, and you will never stand alone before God Almighty. Now, I don't want to mislead you here this morning. This Easter gift of Jesus must be received. It can't be merely heard and then forgotten. It must be actively received. To live with courage and power and hope, we must receive Jesus into our lives. It's more than lip service. It's more than sitting in the church, as it is written. But as many as received him, to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. This can be your resurrection day, too. There's never been a better day than today. I hope you won't leave this place this morning without calling him, calling upon him, receiving him into your life truly as your savior and director. There's never been a better time than now to receive Christ. Just do it.